Laurent Bruzeru, welcome to the show, man. I, I'm so grateful to have you on. I'm, I mean, what you have done for cinema. I mean, when the history books are written, your name is going to be there. You have, you've celebrated some of the most important filmmakers. And moreover, you, you, you've made filmmakers that weren't of necessarily my generation, you know, immortal. And that's the beauty of cinema is it, when it's done right, it's a shot at immortality. And moreover, all your, all your behind the scenes making features are just they played such a big part in like inspiring me and giving me hope. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure talking to you. And, and, and um, I, I want to congratulate you on your mission as well. And, and uh, that's really great to be talking to you. So thank you. Well, welcome to the show. And it's such a pleasure to have you on. But before we dig in the work, I'd like to start at the beginning. You grew up in, in France? Yeah. Are you kidding? We're going way back. <laughs> yeah, way back. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, yes, I grew up in France. Uh, Earthquake cinema. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it was it was actually uh, really a great place to grow up on. Uh, um, it was it, because the French, you know, for better or for worse, you know, they love movies, you know, and and um, so as a kid, you know, I I would go to to see all those old American movies. And I literally did not like French cinema or, um, or even European cinema. I just automatically gravitated to American movies. And I don't know where that came from, really. But Who was helping cur curate? Were your parents or was it just you going to the cinema alone? Um, it was just me. I was, you know, my mom kept a diary about my personality from zero to seven years old, which is a really scary thing because she describes me and I haven't changed. <laughs> and, uh, I, 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 I have a lot less hair, but you know, at, at five years old, I apparently said I want to direct movies. I don't remember that, but I grew up in a little town outside Paris and there was a movie theater there. And I don't remember the first movie I went to see, but I remember constantly looking back at the beam of light that was coming. Wow. And I noticed that there was at times a change of beam of light was coming either from that window or that window. So I told my dad, I said, you know, I really want to go up and see what's happening up there. So my dad talked to the owner of the theater. I said, my, my kid, you know, loves movies and he wants to, uh, to see what it's like in the projection booth. So I remember, I mean, I don't remember how old I was, maybe like eight or something. Wow. And I just remember this staircase to the projection booth. In my memory, it's 500 steps. It's like this gigantic, you know, <laughs> moment. Yeah. And going up and I'm scared, you know, and I open the door and it's this overheated cave, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with two projectors and the projectionist was super nice. And he explained to me at that time, you know, um, you would keep on switching reels. Yeah. Um, so he said, when you see a little circle on top of the frame. Cigarette burns. Means, yeah. You know, it means we have to start, you know, the other projector. And then the second one means I have to change reel. Well, I felt had been given the greatest secret in the world. And from that moment on, you know, I just became obsessed with behind the scenes. You know, how yeah. things were made. Because, you know, there's that cliche phrase about the magic of movies, but um, to me, it was all about discovering how things were made. Yeah. And so my, my mom's mom actually worked in the uh, number one film lab in, in France. She was no in, way. in- The, in the Technicolor the, equivalent of- Yeah, it's yeah. called Studio Eclair. And so when I was really young, I don't know how old I was, but, um, she got me an internship there during the summer and I worked with the uh, color timer. So I learned about, you know, like how you would get um, a, a frame of film and you would change the colors and, and then have it processed and then watch the dailies in the cutting room or in the screening room. And, and so I, I really started, you know, diving into the whole world. And each time I learned something, you know, I just felt, Hey, I know something nobody else knows about. Yeah. You know, and then 
the biggest of all the events was uh, the James Bond movie, Moonraker, wow. was entirely shot in um, all the studio stuff, not the location, obviously, but all the studio stuff was shot in France. Um, and uh, my dad, who is not in the film business, was on the board of a bank, and the owner of the studio was on the board of the same bank. Wow. <laughs> so my dad said, hey, my kid really wants to go on the set of Moonraker, can you? <laughs> and, and so I caught him sick for school for a week. Oh and, my God. And I got to be on the set. And it was amazing because it was the set of the inside of the spaceship, you know, <gasps> with, and so Jaws was there and Roger Moore and Lois Childs, with whom I'm still friends with, actually. And, and I remember, you know, the set was, was built and designed by Ken Adam, who is a legend, you know, designed Barry Lyndon and Dr. No. Wow. And, um, and I remember, you know, the film was directed by Louis Gilbert. And I remember I got to the studio super early. And this is before anybody worries about who the hell is this kid who is on the yes. set. <laughs> that would never happen today, needless to say. And I, I walked onto the set before anybody was there. And there was the director, Louis Gilbert, who was just staring at the set. <laughs> and I, I got to interview him years later uh, for a book I wrote on James Bond called The Art of Bond. And, and I told him that story. He said, yeah, it was such a, a huge set. I, I, I was trying to figure out how I was going to film the day. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and, wow. and, and, and so I, I got to be on set for a week, you know, and, and I was paired up with a sound mixer who hated me because I walked doing takes. And <laughs> I, I kept, I Those guys are the good. most toughest dudes in the game. <laughs> oh, I was just like, you know, I, I, I was just, uh, I mean, it was, it changed my life, you know, needless to say. And, yeah. and, um, and so I, I love spectacle, you know, I loved, I, I love the artifice of cinema, you know, yeah. uh, I, 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 and the French movies and Italians and German films and to some degree, some of the British movies, you know, were too real. And I'm like, I'm not interested in reality, you know, I'm yeah. fantasy. And, and what I mean by fantasy, it could be a drama, but I, you know, this, the, the Americans had a knack at making movies that had a beginning, a middle and an end. The, the three French act structure. Film, the French films and European film, I just felt I was being dropped in the middle of somebody's yes. life and, and you never knew if there was going to be an ending or you didn't really know how it started, you know? And it's so beautiful. And, 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 you know, another important, um, uh, so I was collecting movie posters. The first poster I ever bought was Towering Inferno. No way. And, and I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you know, and um, I would go to this one movie store in Paris called Limelight uh, after the uh, Charlie Chaplin movie. And I would go there every Saturdays at 11 a.m. Every Saturday. And I would trade posters, images. I would buy books, whatever. And, was this and, a movie and, rental facility as well? No, or? no, it was a movie, uh -huh. movie store, movie well, memorabilia gosh. store. Wow. You know? They sold movie posters and books and... And there was just one guy there. I mean, there were rarely anyone else in the store. Yeah. But this was a Saturday. And on Wednesday, Truffaut, who was the only French director I liked because he had written a book on Hitchcock uh -huh. and because he was in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you yeah. know? Yeah. But uh, I was, his new movie was about to come out that Wednesday. Films come out on Wednesdays in France. Um, at least they did back then. And so I was saying, Truffaut this and Truffaut that. And he walks into the store. <laughs> oh my and God. I just, I just go, oh my God, it's Trippa. And, uh, um, you know, it was so moving because he went to buy a couple of books. And I said, I'm so sorry to bother you, you know, but I'm so excited about your new film. And I just love, we talked about Spielberg. I remember we talked about Hitchcock and yeah. he was very open, you know. And, and, and I said, you know, I'm so excited. Your new movie, The Last Metro is about to come out. And, and he said to me, he said, I'm terrified because all of my movies are flops. No one goes to see my movies anymore. Wow. And, and, and it was, you know, I was young and I was like, wow, to hear that from someone you 
idolized and, yeah. and with, you, you, you know, and to hear of their fears, even though in your mind's eyes, you know, they're, they're, they're the biggest gods. titans of, of, yeah. Yeah. Three gods almost. Yeah. yeah. You know, was, was really interesting and something I've never forgotten. And, and, and the weird thing is that it's the movie that put him back on the map actually, um, uh, as far as, as the public, because it's true, uh, uh, looking back at that era in his, in his, um, in his career, uh, his previous films just weren't getting good reviews and he was, and it was flop after flop and, and uh, The Last Metro put him back on the map. But in any case, it was another encounter that, that was very meaningful to me, you yeah. know, and, and, um, and to, to have the sort of like, uh, I want to say the courage to talk to him because I didn't know what to say, you know. But uh, I've shared that story with uh, Steven Spielberg when I did my doc on Close Encounters because I was like, you know, uh, uh, it was so meaningful for me to to, to meet Truffaut, even yeah. though I never got to talk to him or see him again. And and as you know, you know, he passed away uh, fairly uh, fairly soon after that film. So um, so it was it, it was fantastic, you know. But I, I knew you know, that my calling was, was America, you know, mm -hmm. and my dad, um, who again, you know, not being in the film business, but, you know, actually changed my life so many, so many times over, traveled a lot to America for business. And he was on, on the Concorde, actually, sitting next to this, um, really rich and, and, and really cool lady, Sally. And they started talking because she wanted, my dad was sitting next to the window and she wanted to trade seats. And my okay. dad said, no. <laughs> 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 and then of course he finds out she's a producer and he's like, oh my God, I'm gonna about to ask her for it. <laughs> and I just, you know. And so, um, he said, you know, my kid wants to be in the film business and he's finishing up with uh, high school. And she's like, ah, send him over. And she lived in New York and she had started a, a small production company. You know, it was the time of the, all those little films being made. And, and she had just done a little horror film that was absolutely horrendously bad called The Returning. Wow. And it was with Ruth Warwick, who was in Citizen Kane of all things. Yeah. And she played, you know, uh, uh, Kane's wife and Susan Strasberg, you know, the, you know, the daughter of Lee Strasberg, wow. but really a bad movie. In any case, she had a small production company and, and I was sent over and that was the summer of E.T. and Poltergeist and, and um, I just arrived in New York and I decided I am never leaving wow. again. And, and I, I went back to France to, <laughs> to eventually pack my stuff and move everything, you know, yeah. had a couple of trips and, but, but that was like, I just loved New York, the energy. I live here. I know it well. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I, I just, uh, it, it, you know, I was pretty um, by myself as a kid, you know, I didn't have many friends and, um, and, you know, I didn't feel, I felt like the odd, the odd guy who just collected movie posters, you know. And, um, and when I came to America, people were so different from Europe. Um, you know, everybody was extremely um, moved by the fact that I was so passionate. Yeah. You know? And, and, um, I was all about Spielberg and Brian De Palma. I was obsessed with those two directors. Like you, I, you wrote a book on Brian De Palma. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I knew their movies in a way that um, at the time, you know, this is before, I mean, home entertainment was just starting, you know, yeah. but I, I had seen Dress to Kill, I don't know, by that time, maybe 50 times I would go, I could recite I knew when you were going to hear a dog bark in the background of a scene. Wow, no way. And, love... and, but, but it, was, it was much more than just like, you know, a blind passion for something. It was like the, something that, was, that had, wow, you can write stories with a camera. You can, you know, it's just so, 
it was like, um, you, you, you know, you can actually emote things with a camera, you know, and, yeah. and you can have tricks, you know, uh, uh, like the Palma would introduce characters that only appear later on in the film as extras, you yeah. know. And when I started discovering, like, because I would go see the movie over and over, I would be like, oh my God, that's so amazing, you know? Yeah. You can only catch that if you've seen the movie once, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and Spielberg's, you know, incredible uh, visual language and storytelling. And, and, and so, it, it, you know, um, people like just were fascinated with the fact that this kid with a really thick French accent knew so much about, yeah. you know, America. And that sort of like, people were so generous. I could, I had so, suddenly, I went from having no friends to having so many friends. Everybody told me you can stay with them. We'll do anything for you. Here are tickets to screenings. Wow. The Broadway show and you can go see it. Somebody took me to see Raquel Welsh in Mo Woman of the Year, Dream Girls. Like I'd never seen a Broadway show before, you know. Did so, you feel an attachment to theater like you did film or not quite the same? Not quite the same. Yeah. Because I didn't understand, you know, the thing I didn't understand about Broadway was the culture. Yeah. Like people screaming at the actors, <laughs> you know, like sort of like, uh, particularly like I remember it, it, it it felt less intimate yeah. than, than the movie experience to me. Totally. And people were like participating almost in a way like, I'm like, I'm trying to listen to her sing. Yeah, they're eating candy and drinking. I know, it's so annoying. I love Harold Pinner's words about, you know, going to the theater. But so, so uh, it, it was kind of, um, uh, so it was not, but, but you know, I mean, I, I have to be honest, I was, I was so obsessed with the American culture that, that I was curious. I was just like, well, this is interesting. And then I started, you know, really buying all the best sellers that came out. I, I wanted to feel, you know, if I'm going to come to this country, I want to be, I, I don't want people to think I'm French and that I'm- You wanted uh, to assimilate. I, I, I want to assimilate. Yeah, that's a great word for it. And so I would get all the best sellers. I mean, at the time I had no money, but I remember that they were, people on the streets selling bestsellers for like five bucks and wow. books had just come out near the strand bookstore you know I yeah mean, i know well I yeah those books um but i would get review copies i started writing articles for magazines so i would get on publishers list you know was so this producer I, uh, a, a guardian helping you guide you or not really you know i mean she she quickly faced out of the business you know and Got and it. um uh, i i've I found myself, you know, like just in New York. Um, I worked for a small independent production company, distribution company called Spectra Film, and they they were part of that 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 group of companies that were emerging in the '80s, like Vestron and New Line. Oh, and wow. um, but the problem was that they were distributors, and and then when they started producing, you know. Um, they lost their shirt and, 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 mm. you know, very few of those companies, you know, survived. And that's when I eventually had to move to LA because uh, they were, you know, the, the industry in New York just didn't exist anymore. Yeah. You know? It's not as uh, binary as, as it, it is now, you know, you can do both in, in, in both places. So talk to me about that transition to LA. Was that tough coming from New York, having this, you know, rich, assimilation and meeting people and having friends to going to LA and knowing nobody or did you have a network out there no I knew no one so wow. it was like it was like again here we go I called my dad and my mom and I said okay I think it's time for me to move to LA so my dad came and and he said okay well you got x amount of money you know and um that meant I had enough money for three months to find a job really and wow. so I moved to LA in December of 1989. And my dad helped me, it got me like the shittiest car. <laughs> so that was on its last uh, leg. And I moved into um, a really cute little studio apartment in, in the Valley. And, and um, 
I spent Christmas on my own. I went to see Always by Steven Spielberg and I cried and cried and cried because I was feeling so, so lonely. Alone. And then uh, I went to buy a TV and what movie do I watch uh, on New Year's Eve but Sunset Boulevard where Gloria Swanson commits suicide on New Year's Eve. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and I'm just like, or tries to commit suicide. So I'm just like, oh my God, this is horrible. So I did have one person who was the, the son and daughter-in-law of that producer from, from New York. And she, he was in visual effects and she was in casting. And, um, and I started to, I remember, you know, this is before the internet and all that, but yeah. um, I sent out because I knew I had three months, three or four months at the most, you know, money wise. Um, I sent out hundreds of resumes. I wow. mean, and um, there was a woman named Nancy Tannenbaum. She had just produced Sex Lies and Videotape. Oh, Steve and had, Soderbergh, the best. Yeah. Yeah. I had met her really briefly and I called her up. She lived in New York and she said, listen, I'll give you four names of people that I think you should meet with. And the same thing happened, you know, like I think people saw that I was such a, a go-getter and passionate and, and I didn't care about. I just want to make enough money to stay here. You know, yeah. I didn't care what it was, you know. And frankly, I didn't care what job I got as long as I was in the film business, yeah, you know. Yeah, completely. So, so um, you know, those four people sent me to four other people, sent me to four other people. And I mean, in two months, I'd met so many people. It wow. was. Any of your heroes? So like, no, it was all like executives, oh, okay. you know. Got it. I mean, there was one guy that actually I reconnected with recently. Morgan Mason, he had also produced Sex Lies, and he was the son of James Mason, the great actor. Wow. And, and, um, and so we really connected, and he's married to Belinda Carlisle, you know, and, wow. and, uh, and, um, and we just rekindled recently, actually, uh, here in L.A. Um, but everybody else was, um, you know, I met with Ridley Scott's company, my friend Sue, who I'm still friends with, uh, this guy Kevin, who worked for another company. I mean, so I started having like this little group of, of people. Eventually, the daughter of Arthur Hiller, who directed Love Story yeah. and Outrageous Fortune, you know, I had worked with Bette Midler, and she called me up and said, I've heard you're looking for a job in feature development. And I, I, if you want, you can call Beth Midler's company. She has a deal at Disney and, uh, and, and see what, what happens, you know. So, so I met with uh, the head of development. She was on the Disney lot. The company was called Old Girl Productions and it was on Dopey Drive. <laughs> wow. I'm just like, wow, what a start. And uh, so I met with the woman who ran her company, uh, Judy Deitman and, and Bonnie Brookheimer, who was Beth Midler's producer. And uh, um, I made a good impression, but there were a lot of people. At the time, again, you have to remember, this is 1990. Yeah. And they were like, I know, I don't remember, I don't know why I remember that number, but, but like 54 people had applied. Wow. And they selected three out of the 54, and I was one of them, to meet with Beth Midler, right? And she was going to make the decision. And um, I had to come up with five potential movie story idea, like a remake, a drama, a comedy, a horror film. I mean, like, you know, and wow. I had pitched that to them. And remember, I've been in America like seven, eight years, so my accent is still pretty, <laughs> <laughs> my English is a little rough, but, um, you know, I got the job. Wow. So, so that was my first job in, in Hollywood, but, you, you know, it wasn't really, my my calling you know because uh uh it, it, you know what you ended at, at least at the time what i ended up doing was just reading bad scripts all day yeah you know? but i i got to go to sundance for the first time in 81 and wow. and um and you know i i i made a lot of friends i continued writing books so i was i was very active outside that world and eventually uh that whole medium started of, of laser discs, you know, yeah. 
and and I became really interested in in potentially doing work for um, a company like Criterion, who engaged my my services to do the commentary on Brian De Palma's Carrie. Wow! So, so it's me talking. Yeah. Throughout the freaking movie. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember there was a review of the Laserdisc in USA Today that said, Laurent Bouzereau's accent is a little difficult to understand at times, but his enthusiasm more than compensates. No way, <laughs> amazing. I remember that, like, yeah. you know, I was just like, okay, well that's like neither good nor bad, but it's a start. And, and uh, I connected uh, with Universal, um, uh, they heard about me and they, uh, the head of uh, Steven's post-production, a guy named Marty Cohen, who is still a good friend of mine, um, they were going to release a new version of 1941, wow. Steven's uh, uh, big flop, <laughs> but that had the gathered... The only one. <laughs> yeah, that, that had gathered like cult status and was one of my favorite movies. In fact, I had all the posters, the lobby cards, and they, I don't know how really they had heard that I was this fanatic about 1941. So they said, do you want to do a documentary? And I'm like, yeah. So that was like 28 years ago. Well, did um, you have film experience at this point with cameras? Were you? Not, not really, you know, I, I, I had never shot anything, you know, aside from Super 8 films, you yeah. know. But um, so I, didn't think twice, you know, and next thing I knew I was meeting Steven and doing this documentary. <laughs> How was that, meeting your hero? Oh, you, you know, it was amazing. And the thing that's so amazing about, about Steven is that he was so kind and could see that I had done so much research and that I was really passionate that I was not intimidated at all. Wow. You know, I, yeah. I was... I just felt very empowered by his presence, you know. I was I, I wasn't scared. I mean, of course, leading up to it, I was I was nervous, you yeah. know, because I didn't know what to expect. And there I was, you know, doing lighting and framing the shot, and I'm like, okay, well, you know. Wow. And and uh, but he could not have been nicer. And and the fact that he got excited about talking about this movie. And he said, I want you to put all the bad reviews on the laser desk. I want to make sure that <laughs> so, he was just so honest. And there, so suddenly I was like licensing reviews from New York Times and Hollywood Reporter and stuff, you know, to put on the laser desk. Yeah. And, and, and um, he, he, he was just so amazing and still is so amazing, you know, uh, that, yeah, that, I, that started your relationship because you guys work yeah. together on it on everything now, right? So, so, so that's sort of what I, I and you know the thing that was really interesting is that uh, I You know they sent me a contract Universal, but they said there's no contract for someone like you We don't really know what you're doing yeah. So we're just gonna give you a, a feature film contract and don't treat it Don't show it to a lawyer because they they, they got to tell you not to sign it, but you you know so I just signed it because I was like, you know, they just needed a signature on a document. You yeah, know? But that didn't come back to haunt you, I hope, did it? Or No, no, oh. because, <laughs> and it, was, it was like the kind of document that just said you were delivering, you know, a, a film with actors and yeah. sat like this and whatever. So, no, I mean, it was just, a, they literally just needed a piece of paper. So, so that was kind of funny. I still have that old contract, I think. <laughs> you should frame it. And, and, and um, and you know it was kind of interesting because I was one of the first persons to do this kind of work, and and suddenly what would be perceived as a side little thing or little hobby while having a job became my job and my yeah. career because pretty quickly that whole industry exploded and for, for you know when DVD really came on the scene a few years later, well I mean I was just doing so many i mean i, I you must have been jumping from job to job to job to job to job i mean i have i had three editors and and they were all super 
creative and 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 amazing and we we really connected and and i was just flying all over the world getting interviews and and you know like to the point of what but who we're talking about at the beginning uh before you recorded i think you know was for the first time i was i felt like we were giving a voice to people who had been uh, um uh in really the behind the scenes people yeah. that that no one really knew who they were right that prop today, masters sound mixers yeah. you know yeah you, you know, and today, you know, you take it for granted because it's like everybody knows what a DP is and all that. But, you, you know, really, uh, um, when it came down to it, you know, like uh, back then, you, you just knew the stars and, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, you really had to be in the business, I think, to really appreciate, you know, the, the, the effort and know of, of all that goes into the making of a film. And, and I felt a duty, you know, to number one, preserve the history of certain films where people were disappearing really quickly, you yeah. know? And, and number two, to inspire potentially young people to say, wow, I want to do sound design. Yeah. Wow, I want to be a DP or I want to be a production designer. Or, I want to do storyboards or I want to do, you, you, you not necessarily just want to be a star or a director and, and get an Oscar, you know? Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I, I just felt that, um, at the beginning, at least, you know, that my documentaries needed to be whatever length I wanted them to be. As, yeah. And I wanted to have very little editorial to them because I wanted people to feel like they were sitting across Steven or across, you, 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 you know, yeah. Roy Scheider or whatever. And, you know, like when I think about it, that, you know, Roy Scheider is gone. And when I got a chance to talk to him about Jaws, you know, it was the first time he ever reflected back on that movie wow. at that length. And so to be able to do that with him at that time, you know, was, was important. Peter Benchley is no longer with us. Uh, 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 Dick Zanuck, who produced, no longer, yeah. no longer with us. Uh, 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 um, you, you, you know, David Brown, other producer, iconic, no longer with. So all those people, you know, I had this oral history yeah. and, and kind of on film of, of them revisiting uh, those movies. But, you know, the thing that was interesting was accepting a few, a few rules. Number one, you had to be mega prepared yeah. because, you, you know, it, you, you would go back sometimes when I started doing Lawrence of Arabia or Psycho or whatever, you know, this was going back a few years. Yeah. So I would spend, I mean, I had the, the key to, to, I mean, not literally, but I had access to um, uh, universal files in the Valley and we're talking wow. in something out of Kafka where you walked in and it was this, giant warehouse of boxes you know and and they would pull out you know the box for psycho the box for jaws i mean uh, for hitchcock wow. something and and it was it was just fascinating you know yeah and, and and um you know there were some pretty touching things you know like i i i i tracked down people who whose career had died you know, who were at the top of their game, wow. you know, when, when they were making those films and, and, and who were living on a cot in a trailer park, you wow. know. Uh, um, one producer, who I won't say who it was, but like, you know, literally pissing on himself and, and living on a cot in, a, I mean, you know, I, I managed to get a, a shot where there was a cool picture in the back, but, I mean, it was tragic, you know, because yeah. it just felt, and those people, some of them had Oscars, you know? Yeah. So, so it was, it was, it was sad, you know, and it just showed me the importance of the work I was doing, yeah. you know, to sort of uh, remind people that, that a whole team made, you know, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, you gave, you gave a voice to the voiceless, you know? Yeah, and to yeah. people who, who you, you, you know, no one will ever forget Lawrence of Arabia, but people will forget, you know, Phyllis Dalton, who was the costume designer, or yeah. John Box, who was the, the production designer, you know, uh, or Eddie Fowley, who was this crazy guy that was David Lean's best friend and who was like a prop master, but did all kinds of stuff for him. Uh, you know, I found him somewhere in Spain where he, they actually shot parts of Lawrence of Arabia and he never left, 
you know, the wow. old part on Aqaba was filmed in Spain. And so it was, it was kind of, you know, and, and of course, since then, you know, a lot of the people I've interviewed, like, you know, I think about Sidney Lumet the other day, and, and I did, you know, Network and Serpico and Prince of the City and yeah. got all those amazing moments. And so, I mean, selfishly for me, it was, it, it was an education, you know, but it gives me great, great pride when some people, you know, like yourself, you know, feel like I've, I've, I've made a little contribution, you know? Yeah, you know, I mean, your, your Jaws documentary is incredible, you know? Uh, like, you know, even if it's just a few people that, that you make a little difference, you know, that's all, that's all I'm grateful for. But, you, you know, growing with the industry has been, has been interesting, the home entertainment industry, you know? Yeah. And, and um, it became very marketing oriented to the point where I think sometimes people think I, you know, they'll say, oh, talking heads interviews. And I'm like, don't call that a talking head. You yeah. know how much, it's, it's like it's like calling a close up a talking head, yeah. you know? And, and think of my dinner with Andre, you know, that's a movie and it's all talking heads, you yeah, know? totally. So, so I, 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 you know, I think there's been a little bit of stigma attached to what I do because uh, a lot of people feel that it's manipulated by marketing and by the studio. Uh, and I have to say, because I have the privilege of working with really uh, amazing filmmakers, you know, um, I, I, I do have a voice um, when I do uh, one of those uh, uh, films, you know, and, um, and so I, I, you know, I'm glad that, that you, you noticed. Um, Very much so. You know, as, as that niche market became mainstream, and as we've seen, you know, the past few years, the world of documentary filmmaking just exploding. Yeah. Um, um, I In some ways, superseding cinema, you know, as, oh. as Marvel properties have become the dominant force. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, with this situation we have right now, it's the type of filmmaking that's going to thrive because you don't need big crews, you yeah. know? And... and so um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, you, you know, it's a field that I think is really important. Now, to me, you know, uh, the only big difference, you know, between narrative and, and, and documentaries is that with a documentary, you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. You know? Right. Yeah. And that's been true for, you, you know, whereas with the script, you know, and you make a narrative at this, you know what the story is, right? Yeah, and you got the storyboards and you have an I idea. Mean, I mean, hope, I mean, you know, it's, it's as hard to make the best movie as it is to make a worse movie, I guess. But, uh, um, you know, in, and no one sets out to make a bad film, you know? Yeah. Uh, but um, at least you have a script. So, but, you know, it's just as hard to get a performance from someone in an interview setup as it is to, get a performance from an actor when you have to do a really intense sequence. Yeah. Know? Um, and I'm not saying that my interviews are performances because they're hopefully genuine and real, yeah. but you know, you need to guide the people to not, not only trust you with their stories, but remind them of things that they may have forgotten and create an environment and a, and a, you know, some sort of, of, um, uh, a journey that feels worth it to them to to embark on, and I've had situations where where people have walked in, in I've, I've walked in not wanting to do the interview. Yeah, and and uh, and again, I'm not saying that you know. Oh, look at me! I'm just saying that I always come in so prepared that they've come out of it thanking me and saying, you know. This was really great. I, I, I didn't know I could speak that way or that I could share that way. So it's been an in, a, a, a great, and you know, it all comes from passion and curiosity and knowledge of, of really looking at something in a, in a profound kind of way, you know, in the same way that you listen to music. And, you know, the thing that's interesting about cinema is that for, for many years before home entertainment, a film was meant to be experienced once, really. You know, 
I mean, you, you would see it in the theaters and, and then I, not many people would want to see the same movie over and over. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of unique in the art form because when you think about music, you know, you listen to music over and over. Yeah. Painting, you look at them over and over, you know. But cinema is very unique in that way, you know, that, that it was really meant to be experienced once, you know, and that very few repeat performances. Well, that changed completely with, you, you know, the advent of, of home entertainment, where people would suddenly now watch things over and over. Yeah. And you could argue that that was happening on TV, but on TV you had commercials and it was not as, you know, um, it, I'm sorry, there's somebody doing some banging. Uh, um, but on TV, it wasn't as, um, you, you know, as, as profound as, as what we have with home entertainment, you know? Yeah. So, so it's been great growing with that. And, and back to, to, to the explosion of documentary filmmaking, you know, I, I, I partnered up quite a bit with, um, so, so um, uh, you know, I partnered up with Amblin Television and, and uh, Turner, and we created a series together called Night of the Movies. That was, that was really great fun to do. And then uh, um, I did a feature documentary on Dick Zanuck, uh, the producer of Jaws, which was really an amazing, amazing experience for me. And, and sad at the same time, because the day he saw the, the, the final cut, you know, <clears throat> he said to me, well, let's have lunch and let's celebrate. So we made a date to go on Friday. He called me maybe like Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. And then, and then uh, the Friday morning and I'm getting ready to go and meet him. And I get a call from his office that he just died. Oh my you know? God. And so that changed the course of the ending of the film. You know, suddenly that became the film that we showed at his memorial. And, and everybody in the business came. It was at the Academy. And I mean, and I mean everybody, all the studios, all the, the people who, who knew him from Warren Beatty to, I mean, like Steven and, and um, it was, um, you know, it, it reinforced the, the, the notion of the importance of, of documenting those people, you know, yeah. and um, hold on just one second. And so then, you know, um, that led to um, one day getting a call from Stephen's office and, and, and uh, saying, you know, have you heard about a book called Five Came Back? And, and uh, um, I, I said, yes, I, I, I mean, I think that's a fantastic book and, and yeah. I love Mark Harris. And, and uh, well, you know, we're setting it up at Netflix and, uh, and um, we want you to direct it, you know? And, um, and that was a collaboration with Amblin and Scott Rudin and Barry Diller and an incredible experience. And, and, you know, it challenged me quite a bit because of course, you know, the, the temptation was to do, um, to interview historians and survivors and uh, family members to tell the stories of those five guys, you know? And, and, um, I remember Scott Rudin particularly challenging me to finding a better yeah. way. And, and, and he was right in the sense that, you, you know, a lot of people don't know who those great directors are, sadly, you know. A lot like you, of, you really exposed them to me, you know. I, I knew John Huston, but I didn't know the other ones quite well, as well. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so it's, it's sad that they've vanished. I mean, people know their movies, but, yeah. you, you know, to really get to know them, uh, uh, I felt I needed to find kind of contemporary voices to, to lead them on. And so uh, that's when I came up with the idea of Guillermo and, and Steven. And, and having the modern biggest, and, some of the greatest cinema contributors of our time reflect yeah. on them and their, that was wonderful. I love that. Yeah, thank you. So, so in any case, so, so that was, that was a fantastic experience and, and, um, I have to say, you know, it was so well received and, and um, uh, really it was another benchmark in my, in my, uh, in my career, you know? Yeah, it was incredible. I loved it. I, I blew through it, you know? I was like glued to the screen the entire time. It's so riveting and you don't hear of a lot of directors serving, you know, and that was such a unique perspective, especially how ingrained they got with the government and, and the use of propaganda, you know, that you forget that, World War II, you know, we, we've been very lucky, I feel like as a, 
as my generation to not really, other than the Iraq war, not have uh, that kind of a, I mean, this COVID-19 would be the closest thing we've had to an epidemic of, of that. And I thought you did it with such justice and truth. And I, I was, I have so much admiration for that, that piece. No, I mean, it, it was, it was really a great, a great experience. And, and, you know, um, uh, having Mel Streep, you know, do the narration was also Scott's idea. Um, and, uh, um, I thought that getting the chance to, to direct her, if I can use that word, you know, <laughs> when she read the narration and she made some interesting tweaks to it and, and, um, and I was listening to her and I'm like, I've never heard that voice from her, you know, it's yeah. like she, she channeled something. I mean, that's when, you know, your eyes really witness the genius of certain people you know yeah. and she won an emmy for it so she owes me so much. <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> amazing <laughs> so no but i was thrilled that she 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 won because uh it was it was recognized as a great performance on her part and and she definitely raised the bar on, yeah. on that level for sure um and 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 then you know like I was looking for another project uh, pretty quickly uh, as I was wrapping up. Uh, I imagine you had a lot of momentum and a lot of people wanting you to do things. Yeah, I did. And, and, and you know, at the same time, you know, I was, I was super busy because I can't remember what films I was working on with, with Steven. Maybe it may have been the post he was starting. And, Got it. So I jumped into that and that was super exciting. Uh, Quick question, when, you, when you're making the behind the scenes, are you on set the entire time for the shoot? It depends. It depends on the, on the, on the film, it depends on the budget. Uh, uh, on some of them I've been on set every day, you wow. know, uh, or most of, uh, of every day. And some, you know, we select the best scenes to, to be Got on. It. So the, bigger, really the bigger events, you know. Yeah, well, it depends yeah. on the on 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 the nature of the film as well, you yeah. know, and and um, so so. But each time, you know, I try to go into this saying, okay, what are the scenes that speak the most for how how I want to tell the the behind the scenes story? And also, you know, I do have that other hat, which is to think in terms of marketing and, yeah. and, and how how the film is going to be sold. Uh, um, but. Uh, I, I, I signed with WME, which was a, a fantastic thing after Five came back. And, and, uh, and so we started looking for projects. And, and the thing that was kind of uh, interesting, there was a guy, uh, there's a guy named Manoa Bowman, who is one of the producers of Natalie Wood. And he had written a coffee table book on Natalie Wood. And he called me and he said, you know, I'm really close with the uh, Wagners and with Natasha. Uh, yeah. uh, and, and Who RJ. produced the movie with you as, as well, right, Natasha? Correct. Yeah. Natasha. yeah, yeah, And 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 um, and so he said, you know, um, when I was doing the book with the family, there was so much material. We found home movies, we found photos. That there is really a documentary uh, uh, to be done. Uh, can you suggest and recommend a director? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Well, how about me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, oh, you like Natalie Wood? And I'm like, well, I'll argue that if you don't like Natalie Wood, then you don't like movies. Yeah, you how can like you not? Movies. Yeah. You know, and um, I said, I, you know, I would love to do it. And of course, I'd like to meet with Natasha and see what she thinks. So I, we had a, a lunch and, and I really connected with Natasha on a, on a personal level. And, 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 and as I got to know her and the family, you know, what really emerged from me were two big things, you know, was the first thing was um, that Natalie Wood was an autobiographical actress. And yeah. what I mean by that is that after, you, you know, when she, after, uh, as we know, she started like really young. Um, kind of the Leo of her generation. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. she started so young. But after she did Rebel Without a Cause, you know, she was able to to choose the movies that she wanted to make. Because back then, studios owned actors, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And and she took on Warner Brothers. And, and, and so the thing that was uh, really amazing to me was... Um, I'm sorry. Marcus? No, 
Okay. Uh, the thing that was the thing that was really interesting to me was as I prepared for the film, I was like, oh my god, watching those films that she did speak so much about who she was and what she stood for. Yeah. You know. And and so therefore, uh, that was a big revelation to me. If you yeah. want to know who Natalie Wood is, you know, do um, do watch her movies and and uh, um, you'll find out so much about what she yeah. stood for. And up until her last film that she was doing when she passed away, Brainstorm. Brainstorm. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's uh, with Christopher Walken, right? Yeah, yeah it's a yeah. great film. And and you know, in the film, you it's a story of of Chris Walken and Natalie are married and they're getting divorced. And through this adventure they go through, they fall in love again. Yeah. And, and, and at the end, you, you imagine they're gonna stay together. Well, that's not unlike her own story with, with Robert Wagner. Yeah, yeah. RJ, right? Is, is yeah, what he, RJ. Yeah. yeah, Married, divorced, and rekindled and remarried. And so it's, it's pretty interesting that up until the day she died, she was making a film that um, sort of emulated her own love story, you know. In Meta, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, I just found that fascinating. But, you know, the other thing that happened was really, uh, by looking at all the home movies and the personal photos, what really emerged to me was like a personal family story. Yeah. You know? And and um, you, you know a story of great triumph and fame and also great tragedy and sadness, you yeah. know. And and you can't write that stuff, you know. It's like if you put it in a film, you'd you'd say it's far fetched, you know. But her life and what she accomplished in that short amount of time, you know. Um, I knew uh, Michael Crichton quite well, you know, as well, and he died so young. And I, I remember thinking the same way about Natalie, that she did so much in her lifetime. It's almost that, you know, I, I'm not particularly religious, but you, you start thinking, you know, for people who do so much yeah. and are taken away so early, you know, yeah there is a sense of destiny that they're, they're able to accomplish a lot more than the average person would in their entire lifetime, should they live to be, you know, uh, 90. So, so I really love that angle, that personal angle, and, and, and tell the story through the eyes of Natasha yeah. and, um, and through the eyes of, of the people who really knew her and you know the thing that's pretty amazing and and again sad um is that since we finished the film you know uh natasha's dad uh, richard gregson who we filmed in wales you know passed away yeah i remember her saying this might be the last interview and that and it I'm, was yeah you know? and and then mark crowley who was arguably you know natalie's closest friend uh, died a few weeks ago, right before we went on lockdown. Of a heart no attack. Way. Is that the pl the playwright? Or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And when you think that Mart is, you know, became her best friend, and and she, uh, it's all thanks to her that he got to write Boys in the Band because she allowed him to live with her. She gave him work, and yeah. and and um, of course he was mega talented. But I'm just saying that she had such an influence on his career that, you know, the fact that Boys in the Band was revived last year um, and, and um, it's a new film on Netflix soon, yeah. that her influence continues to, to exist, uh, um, even if you don't necessarily know that she was behind the initial uh, uh, play in the 60s, in the late 60s. So, you know, it just felt like a story. And, and the fact that Natasha is so beautiful and young and- it looks and, so much like the spinning image of her mother, you know? I know. And yeah. You know, I was warned about that, that as I'm talking to her, she's gonna start morphing into Natalie. It, 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 I felt that towards the middle of the film. I'm like, oh my, is this Natalie? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny you picked up on that. And, and, and it's, so it was, it, it was, um, a great experience, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, she was a producer, but she 
uh, and, and, and we decided that the interview with RJ was going to be done by her. Then Mark said, oh, I want the same setup for my interview. Interesting. Um, which I fought at first because I was just like, you know, I, I, we, we felt, Natasha and I, we felt like, you know, we want as much as possible to have people feel that it's not fabricated by the family. You right. Know, not, you know, the word that people use is such a celebration. Well, it's not really, you know, it's really this, a, a really intense story of family and, yeah. and, and, and fame and, and uh, fortune and triumph. And like I said, loss as well and tragedy. But I, I really felt that um, uh, when Mark said that, that I'm like, oh, I don't know. I, it's, I said, okay, okay, because yeah, it yeah. was not going to be convinced otherwise. And now that we've lost him, you know, I feel so blessed yeah. that, we, that I agreed to do it that way. And, and uh, the fact that Natasha and he were so close, you get a little window into the relationship that existed between him and Natalie. Yeah. You know, the sort of humor and nonchalant and speaking his mind and, and making you know, uh, jokes about, about, you know, stuff was, was just great. Well, and so, one of the things I, I love the most about your film is, is, is how well you portrayed her, but also how genuine she is, because as an actor, I mean, I'm sure you can understand how tough it is in this business and, you know, where she took people and helped cultivate their careers. When she was a pioneer, like Robert Redford, getting him started, you know, like a lot of people don't know that, that she really facilitated that. And, it was so beautiful. Yeah, no, and I think she, you know, it's so interesting because as she was, uh, as she died, you know, she was uh, going to be doing a stage play of, of uh, Anastasia, as we mentioned in the film, and she was looking to direct something, and she was a producer, and she had television projects, and, you know, she was doing television at a time where, you know, if you're an actor on television, that means that you're a TV actor and you cannot go back to films. It may mean if you used to be a big movie star, that means that your, your star has, has, has died. You know, it's not like today where there's that, that, that no line between the work yeah. you do on TV and the work you do on film, thank God. But back then, it was very courageous to say, no, I want to do The Cracker Factory because it talks about something that I think is important and I want to bring that to people's home, you know? Yeah. I want to do a stage play because I'm scared of doing it and, and, and I will do it and she was gonna do it. So, and, and she was working with filmmakers like, you know, Doc Trumbull, um, who is a VFX genius, you know, he did Close Encounters and 2001 and Blade Runner, but this was only his second film as a director. Yeah. And, but she trusted him and, and, and um, you know, she worked with Sidney Pollack and, and, you know, Paul Mazursky, directors who became iconic for their times. And I, you know, as an actor, you, you, you look at her filmography and you realize she's making each transition yeah. in the business. You know, when she does Bob and Ted and Carol and Alice, you know, it really is a new kind of cinema. Yeah. Or Love with a Proper Stranger, you know, that's not shot on the studio like she was doing few years prior, you know, it's shot on the streets of New York, people are looking to the camera, it's handheld, it's shaky, you know, but she's making those transitions, whereas other contemporaries of hers are not making the transition, and they're slowly being pushed aside, they're done. Yeah. Expendable. And, 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 and uh, so it, it's pretty inspirational, and I think Mia Farrow said it best also when she said, you know, if you if you want to be an actor, you know, um, you know, you should watch her performances because there's not a false note in them. Yeah. Whether the movie is good or not, you know, when she, I mean, Inside Jesse Clover is not a great film, but her performance is, 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 is it blows you away. You yeah, know? absolutely. Why, well, I, I, Lauren, it's been amazing having you on. I got a final couple of questions, but I would love to have you back on someday. We could do like a, a two hour episode, just, no, and I'm sorry, I don't need to be rambling on. And, no, and no, 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 no. I, 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 I got the heads up that you have to go to, to another one. So I want to make sure that yeah. I, I end on a proper note. Having all the experience that you've had under your belt going from the young kid in France to now, working with some of the greats in these behind the scenes and on set, what, what, what are some of the takeaways you've, you've learned about 
to be a great artist? You know, I know that's a very broad question, but. No, no, I, I think it's a really great question because I've asked myself that. I think the biggest thing is to constantly reinvent yourself mm -hmm. and, and, and stay, to stay current because harder than achieving success in any aspect of the film business, you know, in any branches, is to have longevity in it, yeah. you know? And I think you can only accomplish that if you courageously reinvent yourself, um, constantly curious, and if you're gonna talk about someone like Natalie Wood, who symbolizes, you know, a certain period of Hollywood, bring a, a perspective of a young person like Natasha, yeah. bring a perspective that young people are gonna be inspired and want to watch this. Don't do it in an old codger kind of way. <laughs> totally, yeah. And, and, and so that would be my, my, my so-called wisdom, you know. Amazing. It's very beautifully put. And, and what's next for you and any chance that we, moreover, myself, could get you to do a narrative feature one day? Yeah. Uh, no, you can. I have actually, um, I have a, a feature film in development. Amazing. With a great producing team. And, and um, I don't want to say too much about it because it will jinx it. But yeah. I, I have been trying to do narrative film. And it's very hard to make that transition, you know. I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, uh, but I, I, I was at some point developing your project with Stephen King and, and that didn't work out, but we said good friends. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, uh, um, you, you know, so I'm constantly looking for that. And, and I have another big documentary that I'm developing uh, with Dustin Lance Black, who wrote- uh, Oh yeah, uh, great you know? screenplay writer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he wrote his autobiography called Mama's Boy, which is really one of the best books. Um, uh, ever written, I think, uh, about oneself, uh, reflection on a, uh, on a very, very compelling family life. And his mom, who was the victim of a pandemic, actually, uh, polio. And um, it's an amazing, amazing story. And I have a really interesting uh, point of view on how to do it. And, and so we're developing it together. So I hope that it goes really soon. Why I, I really look forward to both, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've done as a, as an actor, as an artist, as a connoisseur of cinema. You're a real hero, and when the history books are written, I promise your name is going to be at the top of that list. And moreover, I hope one day we get a chance to work together when you, when you're doing your feature. Send I, me an audition. <laughs> I, I love it. Congrats on 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 your own inspirational uh, journey, and and uh, thank you for your kind and generous words. It means a lot. Oh, it means a lot to me, and I, I'd I really would love to have you back someday. Next Any project, time. Lauren. Th thank you so much for being here. Okay, thank you. Take All care. All right, take care. Bye. -bye.